Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest fox casting either side of the breach. Today's story deals with history, loyalty, rebellion, and betrayal. Sometimes being bigger and stronger than those around you is enough to ensure you get your way, but sometimes being bigger and stronger just isn't enough. I hope you enjoy The Black Sheep, right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Breach Star Broadcast is brought to you by Smith & Travis Pocket Watches. The master horologists at Smith & Travis deal in only the finest timepieces imported to Malavo from the four corners of the earth or made on site by our very own watchmakers. They're perfect for checking how much time you have left to live or wiring up as a timer on a bundle of dynamite. So come on down to Smith and Travis. Time is running out. The Black Sheep by N. A. Wolf. She asked the question, Do you remember what happened to them? I mean, your parents. Silence before he answered. No. She was quick to retort. How can you not? Because I've stopped caring. I won't remember them. I won't. It's not difficult to hate them when they've treated me as a burden. A chuckle. She replied curtly. Oh, is that so? A burden? No. Perhaps a disappointment. They loved you. You were given everything and you lost it. Squandered it. You are a waster and your parents knew it. You don't know anything about me. We're done here, lady. The scraping of metal chair legs on hard wood and woven reeds. Sit down. You are ruining my tatami. That you are in Malafo tells me everything I need to know. Who else belongs in Malafo, except those who are exiled here? As one of your people would say, hell has a unique way of inspiring the worst sort of company. Why are you here? A pause. Moments for careful reflection. He offered, I'm here for the one thing no hell will give me. And what is that, if I may ask? Your notions of heaven and hell mean little to people like us. They are not of us, I am proud to say. No riddles. What do you really want? No pause this time. An immediate answer, ardent and sure. Redemption. A genuine sigh. Domenici, she said. You are looking in the wrong place, fool. And you will pay for it. London had changed for the worse. It was not just the introduction of martial law, curfew, armed patrols and cumbersome security checkpoints. Her people had become grave and sullen, too. No longer did they loiter casually in the streets to greet passers-by. The cheerful peddlers, cobblers and shoe shiners, who once whistled in the interstices between the great roads as they worked for generous tips had disappeared. The municipal gardeners who took great pride in both their work and their prodigious skill were sacked. The city's once lush foliage had wilted in turn. The trees were dying, and the grass in all of the parks lay unkempt like overgrown, ugly brown stains that seeped into the city's aged, sooty cobblestones, unfettered by the bite of the curb. 
trash rotted in the streets. Cigarette butts and wrappings were tossed in haste at overflowing garbage bins, their erstwhile owners too anxious to arrive at their next destination to tend to them. The garbage men had been drafted as patrolmen. And then there was the fog. It steamed from the sludgy, bubbling surface of the Thames, never ceasing to roil over the walled banks into the heart of the city. The rain was constant as well. Thick droplets pounded the blackening streets and the ruddy buildings. It would not be long before noxious grime filled all the crevices between the city's worn bricks like an infectious disease. With the city dying, public conversations were rarely conducted above a whisper, as though at the sickbed of a terminally ill patient. Quiet had become a custom, fear a precept. At night, the streets were empty. Every day had been monotonous and similar. The gloomy trudge to work in the early hours of the morning, ten hours of slavish, feverish toil under the eyes of guild overseers, and the anxious sprint home before curfew set in. Violators were shot, usually on sight. Hasty footsteps shattered the resilient silence as two figures loomed through the mist. A father holding his young son by the shoulder turned from an alley. You can see the city changing, can't you? I won't be alive to see what happens to this place. But I'm so sorry to know that you will, he whispered with a sigh, before pulling the boy close. The boy grimaced. He hated affection. It stifled the sense of adventure and independence he wore proudly on his sleeve. When he wasn't being hugged, kissed, loved, and tended to, he felt infinite, as though the world was his and his alone to explore. He was the hero, the knight, the cowboy, the relic hunter. The roles that involved violence pleased him most. Every day he could imagine a derringer strapped to his leg in an elegant holster, and a gleaming scabbard, with an even more opulent sword at his hip, just like the redcoats carried. Every wall, cliff, and tree he could see himself climbing elegantly and expertly, with the strength to shimmy and leap from surface to surface with the tips of his fingers. Other people were just meaningless noise, the bad guys to be beaten so that he could save the day. But when he was loved, bathed, schooled, and tucked into bed every night, he was just an ordinary boy too ordinary to be anything of import, and he hated it. Get off me, Dad, he said, pushing the man away. Stop it, not, you know. He cast a sidelong glance at the empty street through the fog as though embarrassed. In public? The father chuckled. You have no idea how lucky you are. You are quite far from ordinary. I'm worried you don't appreciate it. I do. No, he said sadly, looking down at his son before ruffling his hair, trying to be affectionate again as though to ease his own disappointment. I don't think so. More footsteps rang through the gloom. The man put his arms around his son protectively. She asked another question. You are from London? He gave another answer. Yes. She continued. The city has changed much since the breach reopened, yes? The city changed long before that. It changed when the guild took it from us. Ah, the guild. A plague. An acute one. Don't they control whatever hole you crawled out of, too? She sneered. They are trying, but we fight them at every turn. Quite successfully, I would like to think. They fight for domination in disguise, bagging the Empire's contests for Zonggu, Singapore, Malay, Java, Bharat Ganraja, and even Southern Africa. Those who criticize her call it imperialism. They are only half right. As you know, the Guild cares little for gold, tobacco, sugar, or zealous notions of cultural burdens and duties. So tell me of London. It will help me determine how useful you are, whether or not you are wasting my time. A dangerous prospect indeed. He gave a laugh, an attempt at a response. A masterfully woeful effort to avoid expressing any sense of fear. 
London was like a port city the first time the breach opened. The guild catalogued all of the things they brought back from Malifaux there, and stored them to be shipped elsewhere. That's why they locked down the city so heavily. When I was young, the breach had already closed. The things the guild brought back from Malifaux were thought to be the last of their kind. The guild had no idea the breach would open again. Things? You mean soul stones? Yes, soul stones. What else matters to them? Power. They are one and the same. The patrol marched in unison through the mist, perfectly synchronized with every footstep. Though it was composed only of ten men, it was disturbingly intimidating. Each man was clad in the bright red and white musketeer uniform of the Empire. The colors seemed unnaturally bright in the grey fog. Only their gleaming, iron-clad black boots and their dark, folded hats appeared in tune with the drabness of the city. They all held heavy, polished wooden rifles by the butt against their shoulders, the cold steel of their shining bayonets hard against the eye. One of them marched with a dark crimson standard embroidered in gold lace. The boy shuddered as the patrol emerged from the gloom. He didn't recognize the symbol on the standard, but to him it looked like a ram with demonic pointed eyes and a harsh sneer. The father turned to him, dropped to one knee and said, don't say anything, do you hear? Let me handle this. I knew we made a mistake turning onto the main road at this hour. The patrol marched straight at them. The leader, who bore not a musket but two swords nestled carefully in scabbards crossed at his hips, drew one of his blades and called, Halt, citizen! You're in violation of curfew ordinance. Explain yourself. Good evening, sir, the man began, pacing nervously from foot to foot but maintaining a semblance of bold confidence. I apologize for the lateness of our hour. It was not our intention to trespass or to disrespect the law. I merely wanted my son to see the city during our evening stroll. We are on our way to our residence, and we will not linger any longer. Papers and identification now! The sergeant's tone was harsh. The father reached into his coat pocket and pulled out two slips of crimson paper. My name is Thomas, sir. Thomas McCabe. I am forty-three years old. Married to Sarah McCabe, forty-one. This is my son Lucas. He's ten. We live in Knightsbridge at the Framingham House. My son, he is yet to see the city. He spends too much time at home attended to by the servants. He rarely leaves the grounds. I took him out this evening because I thought it was high time he saw the rest of the world. The sergeant eyed him suspiciously. And why would you want your boy to see this hellhole? It don't matter nothing. The officer pointed his sword at Thomas' throat. It quivered in place ever so slightly. Thomas could feel the razor-sharp edge scratching against his skin. What business have you with the Guild? I'm a parliamentary executive. You can see on my papers that I have permission to be out an hour past curfew. It is my right, and the right of my son. Right? Right? Frankly, I don't give a sod and damn about your paper. You know something. It's bloody unwise that you wander these streets at night as if you own this place. You know most people are inside at this hour. They haven't got no privileges. That's right, abusive. Executives like yourself lording your power over the regular folk. Sir, I meant no offence. I am a lawmaker. I was in favour of the curfew and against the extension for officials. I merely wanted my son to see the city. Thomas stopped trembling. He stood his ground. The sergeant eyed Thomas nastily. His gaze fell upon his kempt suit, well-cobbled boots and silver watch. He turned to Lucas. Boy, is what your father says here true? Lucas was rooted to the spot, helpless and powerless, like an insect being toyed with by its captor. He could only gulp and nod, before reminding himself that he would never make his cat suffer again. Then what did you learn from your outside stroll, precious child? He glanced also at Lucas' silken tie, his plaid school uniform woven from comfortable warm wool, and the golden pocket watch nestled in his vest, betrayed by its dangling chain. Lucas didn't know what to say. 
Rooted to the spot, he almost burst into tears, but managed to squeak. This city is a dangerous place. The sergeant guffawed haughtily. Say it louder, mouse. I want to make sure I heard you with me own ears. The city is a dangerous place because of assholes like you, Lucas repeated insolently through gritted teeth. Can you hear me now? Thomas McCabe turned pale white. I'm sorry, sir. My son, he's... But before Thomas could offer a proper response, the guild sergeant simply smiled, revealing his crooked yellow teeth. I like this boy. He's got a bit of fight in him, but no goddamn respect. He drew back his hand and struck Lucas across the face with the back, keeping his sword levelled against Thomas' throat with the other. The boy fell to the ground, blood gushing from his mouth. He fell hard on the cobblestones and skinned his knee. He didn't cry or squirm. He just looked up at the red coat with pure hatred building behind his deep brown eyes. I'll have you hanged, you bastard, began Thomas in outrage. Striking a child. Striking my son. The sergeant began to laugh as the other patrolmen leveled their rifles at Thomas. You'll stay right where you are. He bent down and leveled his sword lovingly to Lucas' chest. Have some respect, boy. I'm going to show you something. You see this? He pointed enthusiastically at the saber resting uncomfortably close to Lucas' heart. It's nice and sharp. I have something that can hurt you. I'm bigger than you and stronger than you. So I'm going to take something of yours. And you're going to sit there like a good little boy and let me. Lucas closed his eyes as the blade came closer and closer to his chest. He thought the end was coming. There would be no more adventures. He would never be a cowboy or a treasure hunter again. The blade sank through his uniform and grazed his skin. The tip connected delicately with the chain of his pocket watch. The sergeant wrenched the blade backwards, ripping through his fine shirt. He flipped the trinket in the air and caught it with a satisfied smirk. This is mine now, see? Remember, boy, don't bloody mess with people bigger than you are. You, the officer sheathed his sword and pointed at Thomas, teach your boy some goddamn manners. All right, lads, he whistled at his patrol. We're off. As soon as the men turned their backs, Thomas rushed to pick his son off the ground. He hauled him up by the collar angrily before whispering, Lucas, are you daft? I told you not to say anything. And now look. Are you hurt? Lucas brushed himself off and spat blood onto the cobblestones. You didn't protect me. You just stood there as he took Mum's watch. He turned his back. You don't care, do you? He sulked, shivering from where the breeze touched the cut skin under his ripped shirt. Of course I care. You're lucky that the watch is all they took. Listen to me. You were bloody foolish tonight. Don't you understand why he took it from you? Because he was bigger than me and stronger than me. But one day, Dad... I'm going to find him, and when I'm bigger and stronger, I'll ram my own sword right up his... Thomas McCabe grabbed his son by the scruff of the neck and turned him around. His face was streaked with blood, tears and grime, his eyes red and swollen. Thomas' heart sank. He couldn't bear to see his son so woebegone, but it was imperative that he understood. Listen to yourself. You don't appreciate anything, do you? We're not like other people. They took what you had, because they didn't have anything. And us being out here past curfew was a stark reminder of that. Now promise me you'll think before you open your mouth. There are a lot of people who hate us. You should respect that and be sensitive. I want my watch back. Why did he have to take it? Why? I want that man dead. It's because he's got nothing else to live for, you hear? Open your eyes, Lucas, or you'll be bumping into walls for the rest of your life, and I won't be there to pick you up when you fall. She snorted. You arrogant fool. I was a child. What did you expect, lady? 
for you to have a different disposition than you had all those years ago. But I can tell from your expression that you haven't changed a bit. A pause. For the second time, you don't know me. I know you better than you know you. You grew up in London. What brought you to Cairo? Cairo? he asked, plainly, feigning ignorance. You know damn well what I'm talking about. Cairo. Another pause. A calculated silence, and then another question. Tell me about Karen. A fist slamming on the table. We're done here. A leveled Bicento. No, we're not. Karen. Your fiancé. Dead by your hand. If you think I killed her without a second thought, what do you think I would do to you? She laughed. Nothing you'll live long enough to see. Karen. Now. There was sand everywhere. In his shoes, in his hair, in the folds of his tender ears where the hot desert wind had blown it with a gentle caress. He didn't mind, though. It was part of the job, and the slight discomfort and the mild itching fix could hardly compare with the value of the riches he was sure to discover. Lucas McCabe glanced down at the worn black leather notebook in his hand. He scratched his chin pensively as he gazed at the torn pages with a grimace. This is the place. The drawing's identical, he murmured to himself. He gesticulated at a sandy dais half buried in the dune before him. It was made of aged, cracked, yellowing stone circumscribed with rugged hieroglyphs. To the uninitiated, it looked like a rock. It was hardly a surprise that it had been overlooked for centuries, but for McCabe, it was a marker to a great lost treasure. Four years at Oxford had shown him not to overlook the obvious. He turned to the five men accompanying him. They were clad in the white robes of desert nomads, their faces hidden by light balaclavas protecting them from the harsh rays of the sweltering sun and the coarse grains of sand lifted by the fickle breeze. In almost perfect Arabic he commanded, Dig. We don't have much time. He grabbed the shovel strapped to his backpack and began to dig eagerly. One of McCabe's companions stopped him abruptly. Are you sure you want to do this? Some things are better left untouched. I'm not paying you to question me, Ibrahim. I'm paying you to help me dig. McCabe patted him on the shoulder with a smile. And pay you I will, my friend. The man sighed sadly, and he and his companions buried their shovels and picks into the dust. Within the hour... Just as the sun began to sink ever so slowly behind the dunes, they had fully exposed the dais. It was a perfect circle, made up of several interlocking concentric stone rings. In the middle of it all sat a great eye with a curved brow, two elegant strokes carved into the stone flowing forth from the bottom lid. The Eye of Horus, said Ibrahim with a grimace. A ward of protection to the ancient people who built this here, Sir, please, don't do this. We can still turn back now. There is no need to desecrate the place of our ancestors. McCabe interrupted him with a snort. You've done your part, Ibrahim. You can turn back with your people now. If you won't be of any use to me, I don't see any reason why you should stay. I can find my way back through the desert. I've been doing this long enough. This valley is dead. There's nothing left here that can hurt me. What was it that Shelley once said? Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretched far away. She gave a snort of impatience. I asked you to tell me about Cairo. Why are you wasting my time? You're reciting poetry. Crass poetry at that. Nothing like the haikus of my people. An ardent retort. Shut up and listen. You want answers? Stop asking me all these damned questions and let me talk. 
It's my prerogative to ask, and yours to answer. Then, this is leading up to Cairo, lady. Give me a minute. All of this will come around, but you need to know what happened in the Valley of Kings that day. The Valley of Kings? A mass grave where the Egyptians buried their god pharaohs. How primitive. Listen, I don't know who you think you are, lady, but you think you and your people are so goddamn superior to the rest of the world. When you wield the thunder as I do, it is natural to see yourself as superior. Silence. The golden amulet gleamed before him tantalizingly in the pale moonlight. It had not been difficult to find. Lucas had dismantled the dais piece by piece with a crowbar and the help of Ibrahim and his aides to discover it winking up at him when he removed the center stone. The decaying flesh of the hand that clasped it ruined the romanticism of the moment. Without a second thought, Lucas gave the amulet a hard tug and smiled in amusement as the artifact remained tightly clasped in the corpse's fingers while the arm attached to it broke free of the rest of the body with a puff of putrid dust. "'You won't be needing that any more,' said Lucas to the body, shaking the amulet free of the dead fingers, which refused to release their treasure until the mummified hand at last dropped into the sand. "'You should show more respect,' said Ibrahim sourly. Turning his gaze away from Lucas as his companions began whispering furiously amongst themselves, "'That belonged to a king once.' Once, said Lucas with a steely grin, but now it's mine. We can make camp here for the evening. We'll never be able to return to Cairo now. It's too late, and the guild patrols are roaming the city walls. He gazed at the amulet in his hand. It looked exactly like the dais. It was made of pure gold with interlocking concentric rings engraved with hieroglyphs, but in the center sat a dark green gem that glowed faintly with ethereal light even though Lucas' shadow covered it from the bright rays of the moon. It would fetch a nice price, Lucas thought, satisfied. Karen awaited him in Cairo. The money he could earn would allow them to elope for a couple more weeks, before financial needs once again made the better of them both. Ibrahim tapped McCabe on the shoulder. Do you know what you hold in your hands? A mighty fine piece of treasure. Should fetch quite a hefty sum, I think. You say you are an Oxford graduate. That doesn't mean I paid attention in class. It just meant that I paid off the right people. Studies never appeal to me much. You can get anything you want with a little force and by being bigger than the people in your way. He drew a golden pocket watch from his vest and stroked it thoughtfully. A bad habit he'd developed since he'd gotten the trinket back. He never wanted to lose it again. The only other man who had wanted it found himself at the bottom of the Thames one evening heart pierced by a strategic sword stroke through the breast pocket and throat subsequently split. The second stroke had been unnecessary, Lucas thought, but oh, so satisfying. Ibrahim scoffed. Do you know what these rings represent? Profit. No, said Ibrahim, shaking his head again and putting his face in his wizened hands. There was a legend that there was once a pharaoh who killed his own son over an altar like a lamb as an offering to the gods to show his willingness to obtain immortality and power, whatever the personal sacrifice. They say that the gods were displeased by his hubris and opened a great tear in the sky, a giant hole in the very fabric of reality itself, from which thousands of horrors entered the world to slaughter the pharaoh and his entire court. The child's tale. No, a reminder. Of what? That sometimes, no matter how big and strong you are, there's always someone bigger and stronger who will not hesitate to cut you down at the heels. Ah, uh, speaking of which, said Ibrahim excitedly, clapping his hands together, it's time. Before Lucas could ask him what he was talking about, Ibrahim forced him to turn around. The pale moonlight illuminated two figures approaching from the crest of the nearest dune, like haunting desert apparitions. The next thing he saw was far less intriguing. Five blades drawn, five pistol hammers pulled back. When he turned round again, he'd come face to face with Ibrahim's own Derringer. Whoa! My friend, I said I would pay you and your mates. There's no need for this. He glanced around, licking his lips, ready for a good brawl. But he knew he would never make it without a chest full of lead. 
I'm not your friend, Lucas McCabe, said Ibrahim with a sinister, determined grin. Nor are the people we work for. I don't understand. We're in the middle of the desert. Why didn't you just shoot me earlier? He raised his arms conceitedly, as though beckoning Ibrahim to a challenge. Shoot me. Take your best shot. Oh no, that wouldn't satisfy me at all. I have explicit instructions regarding you, Lucas McCabe. He cast a glance again at the two figures coming closer and closer into view. Lucas scrutinized the latecomers more carefully, and realized that the first was bound by the hands while being prodded forward by the second. He was dressed in garments similar to Lucas' guide. He was accompanied by what looked like a great black dog. His heart sank as he realized that the figure in front was Karen. Fist slamming on the table again. Are you satisfied? Do you need me to go on? He shouted. No. I want to hear you recount every agonizing moment because I don't understand. I thought you killed Karen. Raised eyebrows and a mirthless chuckle. I did. In a manner of speaking. They were tied back to back. Lucas to Karen. Ibrahim pacing around the two of them. The dog began to grind its teeth and drool savagely. Ibrahim isn't even your real name, is it? You lying bastard. McCabe spat. No, of course not. He gave a sharp laugh. You call me a bastard. We have been hunting you, Mr. McCabe, for a very long time. Too long have you desecrated the tombs of our ancestors, stealing priceless treasures for profit. You have robbed our people of their culture and history. Look at the artifact you took today, for God's sake. He dangled the amulet tantalizingly in front of Lucas' face. Do you even realize that there's a goddamn soul stone embedded in the middle? It's the first of its kind found in Egypt. Don't you know what this could mean for our understanding of the past? How the hell do you think it got there? We might never know, because you were going to pawn it like it was some common object. The people I work for, they hunt thieves like you and bring them to justice for the sake of history itself. And we are everywhere. It is only a matter of time before we found you. And now that we have, rest assured, Mr. McCabe, you will face justice. Take a good look at what you were about to lose forever. He tossed the amulet at Lucas' feet, before bending down to look Karen straight in the eye. She quailed before his gaze. McCabe said nothing. He struggled against his ropes, but they wouldn't budge. You've taken countless things from us, Mr. McCabe, but we're not going to kill you. It's your lucky day. His eyes lit up in excitement. Oh no, you need to feel the guilt of everything you've done as it crushes you slowly and painfully, grinding you down into nothing. Your life as you know it will fade away slowly. As you have taken our past, we will take yours. And how are you going to do that exactly? said Lucas with a snort. It's simple. He loaded his pistol and shot Karen three times in the chest. Lucas felt her blood seep through the back of his shirt. He let out a feral howl. When he tried to embrace the lifeless body of his fiancée, his fetters stopped him from turning around. She was gone, he was certain, and he could never bring her back. I didn't kill her, but I might as well have pulled the trigger. These people. I never saw them coming, he said. She looked unconvinced. Did they just let you go? Not exactly. Do you see, said Karen's executioner with a shrug, what it is like when people bigger and stronger than you beat you to a pulp? Your insolent strong-arming works both ways. It was only a matter of time before fate brought you face to face with someone deadlier than you. Lucas could not say anything. He merely rocked back and forth in the sand, as Karen's warm, sticky blood engulfed him. 
He had not felt so small since that night in London, when the guild patrolman had taken his mother's pocket watch. Both times he had danced at the very lineman of death, only to be left alive and wishing that he'd put a toe across it. Through blurred and burning eyes, he noticed the gem in the centre of the amulet at his feet turn bright green, just as the last breath left Karen's body. He wailed a final time, and cradled the amulet at his chest, clasping it hard, though his hands were bound. And then, instinctively, somehow, he knew what he had to do. Help me, Karen, please, just one last time. I don't deserve it, but please. Lucas raised the amulet above his head, and without warning, bright green flames burst forth from the stone in the middle, in a radiant jade inferno that engulfed Lucas five assailants in a burning shroud of arcane heat. The light was unlike anything Lucas had ever seen, impossibly bright and sudden like a flash. In that split second, he felt the very air around him implode and pulse, sending an unflagging shockwave in every direction. The five men were vaporized instantly, all of them, their robes and weapons too, their remnants kissed mockingly by the desert wind and scattered into oblivion. Beneath the canopy of the endless constellations, blurred in the faint arcane haze, only Lucas, the great black hound, and the body of poor Charon remained, surrounded by the brooding silence of the shifting sands. Lucas' ropes had disintegrated. He hugged the body of his love close. He didn't need to check for a pulse. He knew she was gone. The discharge of her soul had been her last gift, and a sign of her total destruction. Lucas took one final look at the amulet as the soul stone in the centre crumbled to dust, utterly spent and exhausted. It's just you and me now, he said to the hound sadly. After closing Karen's eyes gently with surprising tenderness, he left her in the desert to be consumed by the sands, one with the earth and lost forever. It was what she would have wanted, he thought, but then he was never sure. Lucas and the dog began the long trek back to Cairo. You need a new name now you have a new master, I think, but what to name you? He looked up at the glinting moon, full and bright, his only guide back to the walls of the city barely visible miles in the distance. Ah, I know, but only if you're a bitch. He finished at last. They arrested me when I got back to the city. Those people. They set up the police and held me for a murder which I did not, in the strictest sense only, commit. I think it was their hope that I would rot away in a prison cell forever to reflect on my goddamned guilt. A look of puzzlement. You were in jail for quite some period of time. Long enough to make some important friends but a story for another time. In due course, I was released on a technicality, but they were still hunting me. Who? The preservation maniacs whom I rubbed the wrong way. And then the breach reopened. It was time for a new start, and time to run away. Given everything that happened, Malifaux seemed fitting. Slow clapping of hands. You approached us, Mr. McCabe. And you've held my attention. You wouldn't be alive if you didn't. So, I have only one question left to ask you. Why the thunders? Why work for us? Frankly, I don't think you can be trusted in the least. Prove me wrong, she challenged. A careful answer. No cheek, no aggression. Redemption. I have no family because I drove them away or got them killed. My experience, contacts and services are valuable to you. And the loyalty of your organization and its operatives is something I never had. And it's something I want. I'm not convinced in the slightest, Mr. McCabe. A steely glance and a bemused sigh. Neither am I, Lady Yamaziko. 
but we both know that if you didn't have some intention of employing me, I'd be dead now instead of sipping sake with you. A gleaming pocket watch shimmers in the lamplight. I am quite the pickpocket, Yamaziko said dangerously. Consider this collateral. Serve us well, Lucas, or my mistress Lady Mazaki will crush more than your precious pocket watch. Dismissed. That's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next time for more Tales of Malifaux.